All right, welcome back. That picture was a throwback picture of uh, my interview with her uh, about eight years ago when she was the finance minister. My guest, like I said earlier, is Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, the board chair at Gavi. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, doctor. Good to see you. Uh, good morning from Abuja, Nigeria. Good morning, Nancy. How are you? Or oh. good afternoon, rather. <laughs> <You're sorry. laughs> it's, still, it's still morning. This is about 10 minutes or five, six minutes or there about after 11. Oh. Welcome to the program. It's so nice to speak with you after so many years, at least to have you on the show after so many years. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, let's get started. Let's begin from the health perspective because COVID-19 pandemic is struck in not just Africa, but other uh, uh, continents as well as other countries. Like I said earlier, coronavirus is in 52 African countries, except for, I think, Lesotho and uh, uh, Comoros. We have about 10,700 plus cases now, over 530 deaths, 1,000 plus that's 1,100 uh, plus uh, recoveries. As the board chair of Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, which is GAVI, and I'm aware that it has helped generate more than $150 billion in economic benefits between 2000 to 2017 in 73 resource-trained countries. Speak to me about what you do as the Vaccine Alliance, that's one, and what type of conversation is ongoing right now for vaccine development against COVID-19? Well, th thank you very much, uh, Nancy, for doing this. Um, I think the world is in the, in the midst of a very serious uh, health and economic problem. And uh, Gavi's mission, uh, we, Gavi was founded in, in 2000, is to... Uh, make sure that it g gives the world's children, children in developing countries, access to life-saving uh, and affordable vaccines. Um, it, it, so, so it vaccinates, uh, immunizes children against infectious diseases. That's the mission. And since 2000, uh, Gavi has immunized 760 million children, thereby saving 13 million lives. And in the next strategic period, we are hoping to immunize 300 million more children in developing countries all, all over the world. We work in 73 countries, and we hope to save 8 million more lives. So it's a very vital, um, a very vital service uh, that this organization provides to the world. And of course, uh, in, in, in the case of the uh, COVID pandemic, the organization has done uh, the first thing that it that we've been able to do uh, is to say how can we make resources available immediately to any of our developing country members who need resources to buy supplies, uh, test kits, um, masks, protective gear, ventilators, um, the kinds of supplies that would be needed. And I'm happy to say that uh, 25 countries have applied for this, and I think 15 of them from Africa. So countries are trying to avail themselves of these grant resources. We are reallocating the resources from what we have already and um, hoping to use that to help countries. So that's the first part. I think the second part you mentioned, Nancy, is about vaccines. Gavi's role is to help um, um, deliver vaccines work with manufacturers to make sure the vaccines are manufactured at scale and then you know make sure they are delivered uh, to to developing countries in an in an affordable manner because very often some of these vaccines are very very expensive and if we don't work with the developers and the manufacturers from the start to make sure they can manufacture enough for all of our countries it means they'll be locked out. We've had occasion where vaccines were manufactured, but only developing, developed countries could afford them. So with respect to this COVID, there are two things we're doing. We have a sister organization called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, that is looking across. It's coordinating the development of eight to 10 vaccines. You know, there are about 50, 50 vaccines under review for development all over the world. Now, in every country, from the US to China to Europe, there's a race on to get the vaccine that can be 
the sustainable answer to this COVID-19. So we, the sister organization we work with, uh, CEPI, and also with WHO um, as, as well, uh, they are looking at this t 8 to 10, but we are also looking even beyond the 8 to 10 to see which one will be the first to be developed that could be manufactured in enough quantity to reach uh, all our countries. And uh, once that is done, Gavi's role is to work with the manufacturers to do what is called market shaping. What does that mean? It, mean, it means we can discuss with those who are <clears throat> manufacturing the vaccine uh, right from the beginning to make sure they produce enough, that the price is affordable, and then we can deliver to countries at that price. So we have to be in on the vaccine development from the start. So that's Gavi's role. We are hoping that in 12 to 18 months, we'll be in a position to be able to deliver uh, these kinds of vaccines to our countries. The next question will be, what makes COVID-19 different? Because Africa has been battling at different sicknesses and diseases. Malaria definitely kills a lot of children under five. We still have Ebola. We still have last fever even here uh, in Nigeria. There's HIV AIDS even in the southern part of Africa. We still have infant mortality in high numbers, maternal mortality in high numbers. So what is making COVID-19 different? Well, I'm not a physician, as you know, but from uh, what I've heard from my colleagues and, and all the doctors around, I think what is different with this uh, with this coronavirus, COVID-19, is the, the speed with which it can be transmitted from one person to the other. The fact that we don't know very much even about this transmission process is something that is being studied even as we speak. But one thing is evident, that it can spread very fast. Second, there is no cure for it. Nobody knows. There are a lot of experimental uh, medicines and therapeutics that are being tried, but there is none that anyone knows that can cure it. And a vaccine is not yet available. As in the case of some of the other things you mentioned, you know, Ebola, for instance, we were able in, in Gavi to work with Merck to, um, do, to stockpile, manufacture and stockpile experimental vaccines for Ebola. 300,000 doses, and this is what was used in DRC recently to save the lives of people there. With COVID-19, we don't yet have that. It will take months to develop this. So that is what makes it uh, somewhat more difficult uh, uh, for, for, for people to master. I think the second thing is the fact that this uh, COVID-19, when it, it is contracted by people who have already underlying conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart conditions, and so on. It seems to worsen very fast. Uh, and in older people, it seems to be devastating. So that is why there's a lot of outcry, uh, especially for older people to avoid this. But younger people can get it too, and it can be difficult for them. But they may not even have any symptoms sometimes, but they can transmit it to other people. So there are a lot of characteristics of this COVID-19 that people are studying and finding out, which do not have answers. And I think that's why it's scary uh, for all of us. That's why you see this dramatic lockdown in, in so many countries around the world, because containment, containment and mitigation seem to be the most effective um, um, measures so far to, con to fight it. Has uh, Africa realized the enormity of COVID-19 pandemic I, in as much as we are all handling it almost the same way, lockdowns, we're handling it almost the same way with the West. But do you think that Africa has realized the enormity of COVID-19? Well, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know if everyone has realized the enormity. It's very scary. But I think the policymakers on the continent, by doing what they've done, since the most effective thing for mitigation of COVID-19 seems to be lockdown, social distancing, uh, and keeping people indoors so they don't get infected. And so many countries around the continent have done this in a responsible manner. They've locked down, they've, you know, tried to keep people um, practicing the good measures of social distancing. But as you know, it's also very difficult in many of our countries to talk of social distancing. And lockdowns, of course, have a very dramatic impact on those who earn their incomes daily. But at least they've done this. You have to try the measures that you know. 
to try and save lives. Can the weak health systems in Africa, which comprise a shortage of health workers, poor physician density to patients, we know our doctor-to-patient ratio in Africa is still a very low, ill-equipped hospitals with uh, dilapidated uh, infrastructure, Will our weak health systems be able to withstand this body or be able to carry this body? Because we've seen that most of Africa's elites and the powerful among us ignore investment in the health sector, seeking medical care abroad. Now, everyone is home. Well, Nancy, you've touched on something that is very important. I think there's some very uh, big lessons that the world is learning from COVID-19. The, the first big one is how interconnected the world is. And this is a huge lesson. So there's no one country that can say, I'm in my country, I'm safe. I have, uh, I've tackled the problem. You can't say that because if there's another country where people are sick, it's very likely that it will come back uh, to, to haunt you. So the whole world uh, is, should be interested in a solution to this problem. The second thing is the vulnerability of the world. And that touches on what you just said. You can see that the health systems in many developed countries is simply overwhelmed. Even those that have strong health systems have not been able to cope with this as well as one would expect. You saw what happened in Italy, Spain, even the United States, let alone our countries where the health systems, as you mentioned, are much weaker. Um, you know, I don't know how many, uh, uh, how much equipment of the type that is needed to to deal with this is even available in many African countries. We're talking of test kits. I don't know how many test kits you can find in, in the countries. I know the WHO has tried very hard to send test kits and we've gotten some on the continent from China. You talk of protective gear for our doctors, our brave men and women who will be fighting this. I don't know how much of that there is. The same thing with uh, ventilators, I've been told by uh, colleagues from other uh, countries in Africa. In some countries, you have some like 20, 30, uh, less than 100 in many countries. So if we get this, if this thing proliferates on the continent, we will be in a very difficult position to fight it. That is why we must do everything now to contain. That is why people must listen to the instructions from the CDC, the Nigerian CDC, in the case of Nigeria, uh, in, in other African countries to the experts saying practice staying indoors, keeping away from people, washing your hands constantly, wearing a mask if you, if you can find one, and all those things that are going to safeguard your life and that more importantly, the lives of other people around you. We just cannot cope, Nancy. So we have to make sure it doesn't spread. Mm. How do you see the health systems in Africa? How do you see the uh, hospital systems in Africa changing to tackle this pandemic because we've also seen across Africa, African governments setting up makeshift emergency units or hospitals or tents. They are either built or they are assembled to cater for COVID-19 uh, patients. Nigeria is putting up tents and temporary facilities as uh, treatment centers. How do you see the health system changing? Do you think that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, there seems to be a reset in our brain structure right now <laughs> to take the health system seriously, thereby changing it? That everybody is at home, even if you you have money money isn't going to save you this time yes well you see everybody has closed their borders so it's it's very difficult if you get sick to even get to a place where if you if you cannot get help at home you can't go out so i think there are big lessons to learn from this covid with respect to our health systems and i hope that when it's all over on, or, or under control we will stand back and think about those lessons by the way those lessons are not only for the developing countries, but even in uh, advanced countries here, they're also going to have lessons to learn. But for us, the lessons are even bigger. The first thing I think we ought to think about is how to be very fast on prevention. Mm -hmm. Prevention is better than cure. If you work on prevention, you spend far less money. So when vaccines become available, we've got to do everything to make sure that everyone can be vaccinated. Uh, against this virus and that we are ready in the future 
to 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 uh, uh, be able to use vaccines. Secondly, our researchers and our scientists, we ought to support them very strongly, so that our own African uh, centers for disease control, our own researchers, our own uh, um, uh, doctors, we support them to also be looking at these issues, so that we can develop our own capability on the continent to deal with these problems. That's point one. Point two comes to what you said about our hospitals and our healthcare facilities. Nancy, it's not only hospitals in big areas. We also need to think of our rural areas away from the cities. What do we even have if something like this happens in rural areas, in, in, in secondary cities, secondary towns? Do they even have the facilities to go to? We have to think it through. What are the health, the health clinics we have in some of our rural areas? How are they equipped to be able to deal with some of these? The hospitals, how do we equip them to have some of these kinds of equipment that we'll need in the future? So after this, we don't have to wait. We need to rethink because if we don't strengthen the health system, you've seen that if there's no health, the economy is going to suffer. And what the world is learning that is it makes far more sense now to spend, you know, a few billion naira, if it's Nigeria, billions of dollars elsewhere, than to spend trillions to solve the problem when it occurs. So I think you're absolutely right. We must interrogate ourselves after this and say, what lessons have we learned about our healthcare system? We cannot just go back to doing what we did before. Mm. Now, with this, because I've seen, we'll come to economics in just a short while. I wanted us to stick with health a bit, just like they say, health is wealth, and number one is life. We're talking about lives and livelihoods here. Uh, but with the fragile health systems that Africa has, and we've seen the economic struggles that most of our African countries go through, do you think that we can slow the contagion? Do you think we can stave off the pandemic, uh, slow the spread of COVID-19 pandemic in slums, in poor settlements without basic amenities? You've seen that a lot of people are coming out looking for food, saying, I've not seen the corona. Meanwhile, hunger is killing me first. You know, mm. so with all this, do you think we can slow the contagion and stave off the, uh, the pandemic? Well, you know, Nancy, we have a peculiar problem with uh, social distancing, particularly in our urban slums where people are crowded together. But we have to do everything we can. Look, the, the point is that so far, uh, um, in, in the beginning, it's been very slow coming on the continent. And most of it came with people who traveled outside and then came in. But now it looks like we may be having some community spread, meaning that the numbers will start multiplying very soon. But we still have a small window of opportunity on the continent, maybe a week or two, to try and contain. And, and so the lockdowns that are being uh, uh, implemented, telling people to stay in so they don't uh, spread it if they have it, so they don't catch it, um, we have to do everything we can in order to slow this down. because. Look, if it starts, we, we are all so bunched up close together in some of our cities and towns that my greatest fear and nightmare, why I'm so worried about this COVID-19, is that if it starts spreading, it might be so difficult to contain. And we just don't have the, the equipment, we don't have what it takes to fight large numbers of, peop of, of people getting this. So now we have to do what we can. I think people should cooperate as much as possible on the health side with, with the government by practicing all the things you've been told, distancing yourself, covering your mouth when you cough. Don't come out if you're feeling sick, you know, so you don't infect other people. Stay away from the older people in your family. Wash your hands frequently. Yes, I know in some of our uh, areas, even water no to wash water. hands. Yes. No yeah. running water. It's not easily available. And I think one of the things the governments can do now that I've been advocating, truck in water into those neighborhoods that don't have. Because we can't ask people to wash their hands frequently when they don't even have water to clean water to do it. So governments can help with some of these things by making sure that in these neighborhoods, even as you ask people to wash your hands all the time, you put in washing basins and stands. And incidentally, I've seen recently some wonderful inventions by young Nigerians, you know, young Ghanaians, uh, Guineans, all over Africa, 
these young people have made these wash stands made of drums and and uh, with soap running through it some of them have solar panels that make it automatic if we can get those things people are young people are making them in nigeria station them all around in some of our urban areas in our rural areas they can't cost that much and then let people be able to wash their hands that would be one thing that government can immediately do to help now let's come to the economic spread Africa is on a lockdown right now. Whether it's soft or it had lockdown, you're seeing uh, from Lagos to Johannesburg to Nairobi to Algiers to Cairo, all on a lockdown simultaneously. Buzzing cap business cities are empty right now. In fact, I, I listened to um, Paul Krugman, and I, I suppose you know him, uh, the Nobel Prize laureate in uh, economics. He did say, uh, when he was talking about COVID-19, he did liken it to a medically induced coma, whereby doctors would deliberately, uh, you know, uh, put the person's brain, make it dead for a while to allow other parts recover. That's what we're seeing right now around not just African economies, but economies around uh, the world because economies are deliberately put to sleep right now to be able to contain COVID-19. IMF chief also last week, Cristalian Nina Georgievia, did say that the IMF has never seen this kind of thing in history. This is a crisis. The world has come uh, to a standstill. Do you think that we understand how much this a catastrophe is for African economies? It's a big catastrophe, Nancy, and we really need to sound the alarm. But I, I will say this. I think people need to take this extremely seriously, extremely seriously. Um, and and in, really, if you see people who have it, uh, who are suffering from this, who have a bad case. It's really terrible. They can't breathe. Their lungs fail. Their organs fail. And that's how they die. You don't want to get into that type of situation. So that's the first part. We really need to keep sounding the alarm. It's not a joke. It's for real. And people should discount all of those uh, false stories that, that you know and conspiracy theories that are out there on the internet please pay attention only to what your doctors tell you the nigerian cdc is doing a good job of trying to get information now track people and follow people listen to what they have to say because the economic consequences people are crying about it and you're absolutely right no one has ever seen this kind of lockdown before um, and and it's very dramatic because it keeps people away from their jobs. Uh, it keeps them from earning an income. Uh, it's a big impact on the economy. And it's something that we are going to have to recover from, um, you know, for many, many months to come. So, so the, the, it, it is huge in terms of its impact. On, in African countries, including Nigeria, it's particularly painful because as you know, a lot of our people earn their salaries earn their wages, earn their money on a daily basis. People go to the market and it is what they earn that particular day that they are going to use to feed their families. People are out there as laborers. People are hawking things on the streets. So many people, even as small and medium enterprises, all of these things, if they are out of commission for a long time, we're in trouble. In most countries, 70% of employment is in the informal sector. So it, when you tell people to stay away and work from home, as they, they do here, many people don't know what that means because they, they, their work is outside. They cannot work from home. Even those who are employed in, in uh, a formal sector, in businesses, in companies, many of them don't even have the equipment, laptops and so on, to work from home. So I know it's a very, very big issue. Um, so at, at the same time, we have to then think, how do we handle this problem of people being asked to be locked in, to stay in for their own good and their own health, whilst not being able to earn money to eat? That is the public policy challenge of governments at that, this time. That is my next question in terms of how do we handle the mixture of hunger, absolute poverty, and now COVID-19 on the continent's informal sector, COVID-19 effects on Africa's informal sector. Um, I saw that you tweeted a picture some hours ago, actually about food distribution with social distancing 
Ghana at this period. Why is it significant to support poor households at this time that their income, household incomes are shrinking or perhaps there are no more now because <laughs> the continent is on a lockdown? So what should yeah. public policymakers be doing to be able to alleviate that effect? Do they even still have any bullets to fire? Well, first of all, before I go into that, let me just say now uh, for, for clarification, I tweeted that picture. A friend sent it to me and said it was a, a you know, good food distribution practice in Rwanda. And later on, many people told me that the picture is not from Rwanda, but from Gambia and was taken uh, not recently, but a year or two ago. So I said to them, oh, I, sorry, I got the wrong information, but it does not take away from what I was trying to illustrate. And that is, this is a good way of practicing good food distribution with social distancing. Perhaps that's not what those who did it intended, but everyone who has seen it now is sharing it because they think this is a good way for us to distribute food without getting people's lives in danger. So that's why I tweeted that. So I think it's still a good picture to look at. Now, coming back to your problem, this issue of what do you do when you've got, got people staying in and not going to work, not earning an income, falling into unemployment uh, during this crisis, this is what everyone is grappling with. For us on the continent, even before the COVID-19 became a big issue in Africa. We were already suffering from that. And we were suffering from supply side problems. Remember, it started in China and then it got into the Europe and the US. And those are some of our biggest trading partners. That is where the demand for the products that we export on this continent comes from. So you've seen the impact on commodity prices. Um, you saw the price of oil fall dramatically down to even the 20s. I think today it's about 36 or so do, uh, dollars a, a barrel. Price of oil, price of gold, pl price of pl platinum, all the things that we export from the continent, the prices fell. And that really impacted um, uh, our, our budgets, as you can see. You know, expected revenues are not what, uh, what, what, what they were projected to be because of this. It impacted exchange rates on the continent. Many countries saw a lot of volatility in the exchange rates and a lot of depreciation in the exchange rates. Uh, it, 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 it has impacted uh, so many things um, on, on the supply side. So that is a big a problem that we encountered even before talking of the COVID coming on the continent. As a result, the Economic Commission for Africa projected that growth on the continent will fall from about 3.2%, uh, that is GDP growth, to about anywhere between 1 1.5 to 1.8% this year. Some economies will contract, some will grow very little, and we are going to have a very slow growth rate. Mm -hmm. So you can see what, what that will mean. Now you come to the demand side of the problem. I talked about the supply side. On the demand side, we also found that um, many of the things, we buy a lot of things from outside, you know. So we buy, the continent buys 94% of its pharmaceuticals from outside the continent. A lot of countries import a lot of food. So this means again that in terms of those things, we've got all these closures of borders, Things are not moving. The supply chain for many of these goods are not moving. Inflation has come in and, and so on. And so that is also impacting us. There are many countries that to earn their money from tourism. That is not coming. Remittances are not coming in. So from all sides, we are being hit mm. by this coronavirus. So, Even before. <clears throat> so, doctor, what do you think would happen? Is it a recession or a depression for Africa? Rightly label it for me as an economist at this time, because just like you said, uh, ECA of the AU uh, just uh, projected and they said 20 million jobs will be lost. That's just the initial forecast now because we are not yet out of the woods. Is Africa going to suffer a, a recession or depression, bearing in mind that some countries, even in Africa, 
some are in recession. South Africa is in a recession. You are on the Presidential Economic Advisory Council. I'll come to that in a bit. So some countries are in a recession. Nigeria just came out of recession in 2017. We are still struggling. It's still a fragile growth. So do you see recession for the whole of the continent or a depression? Well, we will have to. Uh, well, I think, you know, right now we see very low growth. Let me put it that way. And a, a recession coming in in many countries. Before we get to the issue of depression, I think we have to give it a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. It will depend on the extent of the lockdown in many of our countries. How long do we keep it? Uh, keep this? The longer we have the challenge of the health, some people feel that now um, the, uh, the COVID-19 may start accelerating in terms of the number of cases. You have seen, you, you said yourself, we have 10,000 plus cases now. Uh, and if, if this continues to accelerate and there are many more deaths, it means that it might be wise to keep the lockdown going for longer. The longer you keep these lockdowns, the more the economy is impacted because there is no economic activity. And the more likely you're, you are to go into a very deep recession or even a depression. So no one, we, it's very difficult to forecast. From what we know now, we know we are going to have very, very low growth and, and we may, might even go into a contraction mm -hmm. uh, for the whole continent. But we need to wait and see what happens. Can, uh, can that be avoided, uh, doctor? Can the mm -hmm. tsunami be avoided? Can a recession uh, or a deep contraction, as you call it, can it be avoided? If, if yes, what can be done? On, on, on the African continent will so be, be able to avoid that? Because I know that you can avoid a recession, actually. Can it be avoided? What should governments do? Well, I, I don't, I think right now, um, <laughs> I see a lot of difficulty in, in avoiding either very low growth or a recession on the continent. Why do I say that? Because some of the factors I mentioned be, to you before are still at play. We still have a situation in which some of the countries to whom we sell our goods are not yet in a position to, to, to come back to the demand, original demand for those goods that was there in the beginning. They, they themselves are still having difficulties. I think China is now coming back up in terms of its economy, its manufacturing, its supply chain. So there might be additional demand that comes on stream now for oil and other things. But they are not yet at full speed. Europe is still going through a very tough time. The U.S. the same. So some of the factors that would help to alleviate the situation are not yet in, in play. So until those things change, we are going to have a very difficult time. There are countries, as I said, who get, you know, a significant 10 percent, 20 percent of their GDP from tourism and tourism related um, uh, um, activities. Those countries are not going to see this coming back for a long, long time. Uh, the, the, you know, perhaps even not until next year. So when you put all these factors into account, I think we are in for a very rough ride. I'm just, I just don't want to pronounce depression or whatever because we don't yet know how long we have to keep our countries locked up in terms of... Uh, fighting this disease. And I think the first thing we need to think about, Nancy, is saving lives. lives, yeah. lives yeah. You have to be alive first, you know, in order to, 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 um, to pursue economic activity. Mm -hmm. And that brings mm -hmm. me back to the issue of hunger you talked about. I know that people, not just in, in Nigeria, but elsewhere, they're saying, look, we are going to die of hunger first before we even die of this COVID-19. And there's a, a lot of truth in what they, they are saying. So we have to come up with strategies as governments. How do we deal with this issue of hunger? How do we get food into people's hands? How do we get resources into their hands so that they can buy food if they don't have it? This is a public policy challenge that has to be solved all over the continent. And we have to think about it because if we don't, Suppose the lockdown continues for much longer. We can't expect people not to feed their families. Mm.
<laughs> We've seen different economic stimuli from different countries. Here in Nigeria, billions of Naira, trillions running into trillions of Naira. Across Africa too, we're seeing even central banks are coming into uh, cut rates drastically. Some we're seeing like in Egypt, in Kenya, we're seeing eight year lows interest rates uh, Caught. African countries are also approaching multilateral organizations, uh, some of which you work in, like the World Bank, um, IMF, uh, African uh, Development Bank. How much latitude do you think that African countries have uh, to borrow? Because our well, Africa also has a huge, huge debt burden with multilaterals, even as well with China, which we will come to in a bit. Well, you've hit on a very important point, uh, Nancy. Um, to be able to tackle this problem, I think we need two things. First, we need our own domestic resources. And as you said, central banks all over the continent, in, including in Nigeria, have been acting. But that is not enough. We also need uh, uh, fiscal uh, um, policies and actions. And uh, part of it is a fiscal stimulus. You've seen what has happened in developed countries. Uh, they have issued fiscal stimulus in the economies equivalent to 10% of their GDP. In the US, $2 trillion. Japan actually went even further. And it's, it's talking of a fiscal stimulus, 20% of GDP. This is because they want to make sure that the effects of this is mitigated on people and on businesses. So this fiscal stimulus is designed to help make sure that businesses can keep going especially small and medium enterprises, keep paying their workers so that so many people don't go out of a job. It's designed to get money into the hands of people so they can purchase food. You come back to the continent. If these countries have issued fiscal stimulus, 10% of GDP, look at Africa. We've looked at, the, on average, the amount of fiscal stimulus that African countries have been able, able to do. On average, is zero. 0.8% of GDP, one-tenth of what countries outside have been able to do. This is absolutely not enough for us to solve these problems, which is why there's a big movement now, and I'm part of it, to try to get additional resources for our countries. How do we why get do those additional resources, doctor? Let me cut in there. Do you mean, like if you see what's happening in the US, over $2 trillion approved by uh, the US Senate, you see even countries going, you've talked about Japan, some are printing money. Do you, are, are you saying that perhaps, because we do not have so much latitude uh, in Africa to borrow, should the governments go printing money to be able to alleviate some of those challenges? Well, we can't print money indefinitely. You know, the U.S. has a currency that everybody wants. You, the, you know, the, the reserve currency of the world. People want to, 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 to invest in them. Uh, people want to keep the dollar. So they have a lot of latitude to print more money than we can ever think of without having massive inflation. So we have to think of other means. Yes, our central banks can do some, but they can't do as much. So what I'm saying, at the same time, you mentioned that we have a lot of debt. Many countries on the continent have an unsustainable debt burden. The debt to GDP ratio on the continent in the last, you know, let's say five, six years has risen quite substantially, almost reaching 50% of GDP on average. So what do we have to do? We are pressing for two things. One is to get um, external resources to support our countries as much of it as we can get in grants. And that is why I was encouraging countries, if you anywhere you see a grant, 200, 300 million from Gavi, 500 million from the Global Fund, go for it to help you buy equipment and other supplies. We are pressing for grants, we are pressing for very low interest loans, and we are pressing for a, a standstill on debt payment. Mm -hmm. And then a review by the World Bank and the IMF of the sustainability of countries' debt. So we, we are pressing for a two-year standstill. If we have that kind of a standstill across the board, whether it's bilateral debt, uh, 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 commercial or private debt, it, all the debt burden, we are saying, give us two years. The money that we would use to service debt and pay, make payments on principle, which it, it, uh, in some estimates comes up to $44 billion, we will use it to reinvest 
in our economies to help people, to help ordinary people uh, get access to resources to eat, feed their families, to strengthen our social safety nets. So that's what we are asking for. We need it to help our small and medium enterprises and even our businesses to pay arrears that governments are owing uh, to businesses. This is the way that we can make our economies continue to function. So this is what we are asking for. Okay, how about, uh, uh, Doctor, let me butt in here too. How about debt forgiveness? With your own experience with the Nigerian uh, uh, story some years ago, debt forgiveness, we've seen our debts also ballooning. And now, um, what kind of advice are you giving heads of states, presidents, because you advise a lot of them on the African continent? <laughs> yes. So what kind of advice are you, are you giving them? Are you also going on the debt forgiveness uh, uh, road for some African countries? Uh, if you well, are, which countries are they? Look, you, you've seen, I mean, I'm very cautious, I'm very conservative on the issue of debt. I know what we went through under President Obasanjo when he led uh, this uh, 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 drive for debt relief. And we worked so hard as a team under him to get the debt relief. I tell people all my gray hair that I have now came at that time. It is very difficult to get debt relief. So when you've had that experience, you have to be extremely cautious about taking on debt. In any country, you have to watch not just your debt to GDP ratio, but your debt service to revenue. Mm. Because when it gets to be more than 20%, you're using 20% of your resources, 30% to service debt, then you're, you're getting into difficult territory. When it is external debt, it is more uh, more difficult. I, I say, look, if you're going to borrow and it's going to be put to good use, try to borrow from multilaterals at very low interest because that takes a long time. You have like five or 10 years of grace, 30 year repayment period or 20 years. It's better than, com you know, easier. So don't take on too much commercial or private debt so you can service. Any country, if you can service, if you're generating enough revenue from investing that money, fine. But if you're not, you have to be extremely careful because mm -hmm. debt relief is not easy. So we are coming now to this debt relief and we're saying, look, all the same, we are where we are. And what we're interested in is saving lives on the continent. We don't want people to die because they can't eat. We don't want people to die from this pandemic. We are saying to the world, Solving the problem in every corner of the world is in your interest. It's a global public bad. The pandemic is a global public bad. We want to turn it into a global public good. And we're saying to the developed countries, if you're safe in your country, it's not true. If someone in Africa or in South Asia or somewhere, they've not solved the problem. So let's do it now by allowing these countries on the continent to have enough resources to invest. Secondly, we've said also that if um, a, 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 a fiscal stimulus for the continent, the AU has calculated, of course, 10% of our GDP is about $200 billion. And what we have now is nowhere near that. So we're also pressing for the countries to come with some additional, very low interest and grant money to support us. Okay, let's talk about the China conversation. I have around five minutes or six minutes to end this interview with you. Um, let's talk about China. Let's have this China conversation. Do you see the relationship changing as Africa trades the most with uh, China? Most of Africa's imports uh, are from China, even as the West accused China of not uh, being totally transparent with uh, the COVID-19 case. That also takes me to the issue of Africa evolving as a manufacturing hub with the Chinese example of population, which we also have. Africa has about 1.2 billion uh, people. Would do we perhaps after COVID-19 or should we also be thinking along that that Africa should also evolve with this pandemic so that manufacturing is also done here, bearing in mind African continental free trade area coming up, if not because of the pandemic in just a few weeks time, we would have uh, 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 gone ahead with it. Are there any risks uh, to after that you see? Again, you're touching on a very, uh, very important issues, Nancy. First, let me comment on the China. I don't think that as a continent we should let ourselves get caught up 
in disputes or what is going on globally between China and America or any other countries. I think we need to keep our head clear. Don't get caught in the middle and, and think of what we need to do to move our own continent uh, forward. So uh, in that respect, by the way, we are also hoping and asking that China as a bilateral, uh, um, as a country that has given quite a bit of lending to the continent, should also look at this issue of bilateral standstill for the payment of it, its debts. From the numbers I have, I think debt service and principal to China this year must be around eight to nine billion dollars. So if they can join, that is an important chunk of that. So we should work with them. We should take an example. There's something to learn from the way that China has done things in terms of its economy. Of course, I'm totally in support of the idea that we should develop more of our own manufacturing capability on the continent. I think this is one of the lessons we have to learn. Look at pharmaceuticals. If we're importing so much, when all borders are closed, how do you get those medications? So I'm in support of us trying to look at some of our industries. How can we establish a stronger manufacturing capability in pharmaceuticals on the continent? How can we better trade with each other so that if one country can manufacture certain things, they can trade with other countries on the continent? So, I mean, developing and strengthening our trading ties. You mentioned the AFC TFA, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. This is something we should look at. Of course, we have to look at it with respect to making sure that our country benefits from that agreement. Uh, we are capable in Nigeria of manufacturing many things and trading and to the rest of the continent. So we need to put the conditions in place. These things don't just come easily. We need to make ourselves attractive to investors, our own domestic investors, mm -hmm. as well as mm -hmm. others from the continent and outside. But charity starts at home. Make ourselves attractive to our own business people so they can develop manufacturing capability. So you're right. This pandemic, Nancy, should make us stand back and look at some of the things that need to be changed mm. in our economy, in our health system, in our approach to helping our poor people and making sure that people have jobs. Everything has to be re-examined and we need to come out with the proper public policies to solve the problems. That brings me to the question of what African political and business leaders should be doing at this time or what kind of evolution we should see with leadership in Africa. That also takes me to your position as a member of the Presidential Economic Advisory Council in, West, uh, in South Africa. I think congratulations are in order. I haven't spoken to you since, since then, so congratulations for that. I said earlier that South Africa is in a recession right now. Unemployment is high and all of that. What kind of advice do you give to those in the corridors of power at this time? I know you've been speaking to a lot of presidents, a lot of world powers and all of that. What kind of leadership, what kind of rejigging of our thinking, especially coming from the leadership side and even the business side, we've seen what's happening even here in Nigeria. The private sector is taking the bulls by the horns, contributing Twitter, which we're also on the board. The chief executive officer of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, made a donation of $1 billion, one quarter of his wealth. I think he gave it out, was it two days ago or so? So we're talking of business leaders. What kind of thinking uh, should we be having at this time? I just have less than five minutes with you. Well, Nancy, I mean, uh, it's a privilege and an honor um, to, to be asked to join the Presidential Economic Council of South Africa. But I think the, the advice there is, um, this is for the South Africans to deal with. I, I comment, I think, generally on, on what you have said. I think in every country on the continent, um, we, we, we need to be thinking of right now, what does this mean for a longer term recovery? What are the policies we put in place to bring our economies back and to bring them back on the growth path? And there are several things we, we need to look at. How do we stir up those sources of growth? The biggest thing that leaders, including business people need to look at now on the economic, first on the health side, is how do they use their resources to help, to bring the equipment, the test kits and everything you, you, that we need? 
We've seen Jack Ma from China donating so many test kits. Our own business people, I know some of them have contributed quite a bit of money. That is to be applauded. And I think we should use that immediately to equip the country so we can save lives. The second thing is on the economy. I think we need to do, leaders now need to do all they can to save our businesses. I come back to what I said before. If we are talking of fiscal stimulus, if we are asking for resources to complement those we have in, it's not to be wasted. It must be invested in our small and medium enterprises, making, giving them soft loans. It must be uh, given in terms of grants, in some cases, to our, our poorer people within the country. We must also uh, look at big businesses. If we owe them arrears, we pay. All I'm saying is that let us do what we can to maintain our businesses and our private sector, as well as making sure that our ordinary households don't fall into hunger. They can't feed themselves. Mm. That's what you mm. need immediately. And all business people should key into that. You mentioned Jack Dorsey. I think he's fantastic. I'm um, proud of him as being on the board, his board, that he has devoted a billion dollars, one quarter of his fortune. And um, he's planning to invest it to help solve this COVID-19 problem and also to help girls and women's health. So I think those are very important objectives and we, we need to work with him to make sure we also benefit from some of that on the continent. Okay, final question and you have 60 seconds to answer both or final questions. Uh, what opportunities are in this crisis so that we don't waste this crisis? And I know that you're someone that loves young people too. As someone that grew up in a village in Ogbofo, in Ogwashuku, you are my sister too, I must say, for the whole world to know today. Uh, what gives you hope? I'm your much older yeah. sister. See. <laughs> <laughs> what gives you hope about Africa, even as we battle COVID-19 pandemic? So two questions in one. Your 60 seconds starts now. Um, well, I can summarize it. What gives me hope, you've just said, is, is, is the young people. Every time I interact with young people on the continent, they are vibrant, they're inventing things, they are thinking ahead. Uh, you, you, I just talked about this hand, this uh, hand washing stand that I tweeted the picture. It, it's not only in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Guinea, all over the place. The young people have manufactured this now to help us fight COVID-19. We've seen a lot of them in the technology space, inventing things. We've seen a lot of them in the agricultural space. My final word is, my hope is in the young. Let's support them. Let's give them the space. Let's support their creativity. And that is what will make the future. Thank you very much, Doctor, for speaking with me today. I think I had a pleasant time with this uh, exclusive interview with you. I, I just wish we could go on and on and on. But thank you very much for speaking with me today. Thank you, Nancy. Anything you I want to say to Nigerians in just 10 seconds, watching you, those that you inspire? <laughs> Nigerians, I love you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, ma'am, for speaking with me today. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. All right, I've been speaking with Dr. Ngozi Okonjoy. We allow you've been hearing her. Uh, you know, her sentiments across what's happening in Africa and what we must do to fight COVID-19 pandemic as well as uh, saving economies is about lives and livelihoods. That's the much we can take on this segment of COVID-19 Watch, the economics of the pandemic.